2097. Mean anything to anyone? Okay, yeah, someone has said that. So it's 75 years from now. So before we look ahead, let's kind of look back a little bit. Let's not look back that far, because we know what happened 75 years ago. Let's just look back 25 years ago, 1997. Um, anyone remember the world as it was 1997? Globally, domestically, politically, economically, and for us in the room from a social development point of view. I don't think many of us would recognize that world. It was very, very different. Now I'm going to indulge you all for 10 seconds and just, just imagine what 2097 will look like. Your family, your living, where you will work, healthcare, education, all the things we talk about in the morning. It's hard to imagine what life would be, what the world would be, what India would be like 75 years from today. Should we even imagine India 75? Should we even think about it? How does governments you know, deal with long-term planning, long-term thinking. Do we have to think that long-term given all the problems that exist today? America. How do politicians think about it, bureaucrats, policy makers think about it? Something that we will hope to explore in this session. Hi, my name is Murugan. I'm here on behalf of Redis Foundation. So, uh, is, we are a funding organization. We are also an operating NGO. Uh, we run rural livelihood missions in three states, working with the ministry as well now. And last October, uh, we made a commitment to invest 100 crores over the next three years by 2024. And I'm really pleased to be here in front of you just nine months after we made that announcement that we've already made commitments of 50 crores already, more than 50 crores. And the reason why we are able to operate with such velocity and conviction is because in addition to doing grants and running our own programs, we have strategic partnerships with organizations involved in policy making and governance, effective governance. 500 million people have been impacted by evidence from evaluations across the world. And this figure stands at 100 million who have been impacted by randomized evaluations in India alone. And whether it is through better foundational learning for 50 million children in India and Africa, whether it is through you know, 10,000 ultra poor women in Bihar in, and West Bengal who now have access to uh, social security programs of the government, they are, you know, increase consumptions, they eat better, live healthier lives, uh, or Noriga workers, for instance, getting their real wages without corruption and delay through revamped funds flow, nationwide funds flow uh, schemes. So, you know, examples are many, and these are all uh, programs that have been evaluated and found to be impactful. Uh, we also had failed experiments, and we've been learning constantly from failed experiments. It, it saved the government uh, good money and resources that can be allocated elsewhere. And at the heart of these examples that you know, we've been talking about is data and evidence that has influenced decision making and long-run partnerships with governments to impact change at scale. So what makes one government more open to evidence-informed decision making versus the other? Why does a program with impact not scale when we hear many stories of wasteful expenditure towards programs that we know will not work. JPAL South Asia partners with over 20 states and central government agencies in India with the mission to inform decisions based on evidence. Uh, we partner with more than over 500 researchers worldwide at universities across the world who conduct randomized evaluations to answer critical questions to fight the fight against poverty. Uh, we have more than two decades of cumulative experience in working with governments to build capacity, partner on research, and scale-tested solutions. Our work has impacted more than 500 people throughout the world through the scale-up of evidence-backed programs, and we have trained more than a few thousand civil servants over the years uh, through state and central governments. At this juncture, I'm very pleased to announce the launch of Aspire, which is an alliance for scaling policy impact through research and evidence to enhance the use of data and evidence in policy making in India. Aspire seeks to bring together governments, donors, and civil society partners with the goal of generating new policy insights and evidence to inform the design and implementation of policies and programs that improve development outcomes. Aspire is a joint initiative of JPAL South Asia and the Vedis Foundation. Aspire pursues an evidence to action approach to identify the most pressing policy challenges faced by governments 
innovate and test solutions to these challenges and support scale-up of the most effective solutions. This approach builds on JPAL's 15-year-long experience in, in India, working collaboratively with, collaboratively with governments in India by forging partnerships to address development challenges. Uh, we invite uh, governments, implementing organizations, and donors to join this alliance and to enhance our existing capacity for rapidly co-designing, testing, and implementing solutions that India needs. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, it's an even bigger honor to be here um, uh, in the presence of Mr. Amitabh Kant, who for many generations of IS officers like me has been a true inspiration. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here and I uh, look forward to speaking to you. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. This is Delhi is my hometown, so it's a double loss for me. Okay, so let me begin by just sharing my screen quickly. Uh, I have a few slides that I would like to take you through. So my remit today is to talk to you a little bit about the journey of evidence to strengthen state capacity and improve governance. Uh, I'm going to do that by just setting up the motivation for why you know, evidence-informed policymaking is important, uh, both from my own personal lens as well as JPAL lens. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the examples of evidence and foreign policy making from different parts of India, working with various governments, uh, and then end by telling you a little bit about what the motivation has been for Vedas Foundation and for JPAL to collaborate to launch Aspire. Um, all right, so uh, to get started, uh, you know, like my own personal journey with the evidence informed policy began uh, in 1996 when I joined the Indian Administrative Service. Uh, and I would say that I have a very uh, distinct memory of a very evidence-free decision-making that I was involved in back in 1998. I would love to talk to you about that, but time is short, so I would encourage you after this talk is over, if you would like, to Google this article from Instincts to Evidence in Mint, where I talk about that particular really fun example. Uh, but things have changed actually fairly dramatically in the 26 years since I um, I, I, I joined the IAS. Uh, first and foremost, there's a much greater recognition of the importance of evidence and policy policymaking. And more importantly, uh, in Niti IO, we have a great champion for that. Uh, you can see two articles that I just found today. Uh, both of these are from July of 2022. In the first one, the Honorable Finance Minister is talking about how evidence-based policymaking is vital for creating resilient economic systems. And the second one from a, a, you know, a colleague at Niti IO talking about how um, evidence in governance, what is the enabling uh, ecosystem that is uh, needed for that. Uh, but to translate this vision into actual policy formulation and actual implementation uh, requires a little bit more than that. Uh, and so let me tell you a little bit about that. I think the first thing we have to recognize is that officials in government are extremely busy and often have many competing priorities. Uh, so the question is, how can we make it easier for them to use evidence in their work? Uh, there are kind of five challenges that I see here and which also lead to kind of five distinct pathways that I hope I can take you through. The first is that scientific evidence itself is hard to access. Uh, it's often in technical journals written in where, with lots of equations and, and, and graphs and not the most easiest thing to access. The second is India has plentiful administrative data but in-house data analysis skills are extremely rare, very, very expensive. The third uh, challenge is that running field impact evaluations, which is what we do to pilot and test innovations um, um, before scaling them up, is an extremely specialized skill. Uh, the fourth challenge is that once you even have this evidence, then scaling tested programs in a new context requires extensive amount of effort. And finally, uh, there is this challenge, challenge of strengthening staff capacity. Uh, you know, uh, we all know uh, how the skill set of um, a lot of the uh, levels um, uh, that are used for implementing development programs uh, uh, can be a challenge sometimes. And you see that in uh, the efforts by the current government through the Capacity Building Commission to strengthen that. So the question is, in given all these challenges, 
is evidence-informed policy making for these very busy officers who have competing priorities. And even if they would love to use evidence in their work, uh, they find all these five challenges that I mentioned to you. Is this even doable? Well, as you would have guessed, the answer is yes, it is. If it wasn't, I would not be here talking to you. Uh, so let me take you through a few of the pathways that we at JPAL have found to work. So the first pathway, the example is with Niti Aayog, and the first pathway that I talked to you is about sharing evidence from both India and around the world and co-creating solutions. So here is an example where uh, we are partnering with the Aspirational Districts Program under the guidance of Mr. Amitabh Khan on sharing evidence on some of the key priorities of Niti Aayog, uh, including anemia and nutrition, and scaling up some of the evidence-based programs in education to overcome the learning gap that has happened in at COVID. Here's pathway number two. I talked to you about the challenges of using administrative data. Uh, and we partnered with the government of Haryana, who have a really innovative platform called mHealth, which generates tons and tons of really great administrative data. But the challenge is, is how to access it and use it uh, for different ways. So here you see uh, Esther Duflo, one of the co-founders of JPAL and the Nobel Laureate in Economics of 2019 with the chief minister and the health minister of Haryana uh, talking about uh, how do you uh, design a combination, how do you over, how do you increase immunization rates in some of the districts of the state uh, using a combination of text reminders, immunization ambassadors and incentives uh, and using this administrative data to estimate the impact of these uh, interventions. Um, again, I don't have time to go into the details, but I encourage you to Google the study which found that uh, small small incentives, uh, but more importantly, the use of community identified uh, ambassadors can greatly increase immunization rates. So what's pathway number three? Well, the example of this comes from the government of Gujarat on piloting and evaluating a, a novel field innovation to reduce pollution. So this is back when the Honorable Prime Minister was the Chief Minister of, uh, of uh, Gujarat. And so you see here, uh, you know, um, um, Jaypal signing an MOU with the government of Gujarat, uh, with Mr. Modi present. Uh, and so we collaborated with the Gujarat Pollution Control Board to test the effectiveness on, of, of an improved third party audit system on improving audit accuracy and pollution in industrial plants. Uh, Gujarat, as you know, is one of the most industrialized states. And, and so uh, the government felt that they wanted to get a grip on some of the pollution coming in factories in Surat and other places. And again, a really innovative program that I encourage you to Google, uh, where auditors found that, uh, 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 where the study found that as a result of this intervention, auditors reported pollution more truthfully and industrial plants reduced pollution. A fourth pathway is the one uh, of taking proven programs to scale, something that has been tested and evaluated in one context and found to be effective. So here we are working with the government of Orissa under the leadership of uh, um, Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik to figure out how a program that was tested in Haryana uh, to increase uh, uh, gender equity can be scaled up across 23,000 state-run schools uh, similarly, we are working very closely on the scale up of a graduation approach, which was tested in Bengal and Bihar and uh, found to be effective and how that can be adapted to the local context in Orissa and scaled up. So uh, really, really interesting stuff. A fifth pathway again brings us back to Niti Aayog, this time to the department, uh, to, to, to the development and monitoring evaluation office led by another amazing IS officer, uh, Mr. Shaker Bono. Um, and here, the challenge was, how do you strengthen the state capacities to use evidence? So here, it's a, it's a combination of workshops and M&D diagnostic assessment, knowledge resources and output outcome monitoring and administrative data, uh, which they have found helpful. And then I go to my, not my Jan Bhumi, my Jan Bhumi is Punjab, but uh, going to my Karam Bhumi, uh, which is Tamil Nadu, where I was in the IS uh, in, on TN Kada. Uh, where we are working very closely with the government of Tamil Nadu under the guidance of the Honorable Chief Minister uh, uh, through M.K. Stalin uh, and the Finance Minister on 
every single one of these pathways. Uh, so we've launched two panel surveys and almost 20 field projects with a dozen departments involving more than 60 IS officers over the period of the last many years. Uh, this partnership has also led to the creation of a very robust data analytics unit in the state. Uh, we have conducted workshops with many officials in, during these years. Uh, and and many of the advice, much of the uh, few of the advice that we gave has helped inform the state policy for senior citizens with the reform of the old age pension program just announced in the budget, data policy and state evaluation guidelines. So that brings me to the question as to why Aspire. So Aspire is a joint collaboration between Vedas Foundation, um, uh, founded by. Um, you know, a really dynamic entrepreneur, Vikrant Pargava, who is present here today, and Jaypal. Uh, and it's a response by Vedas and Jaypal to increase, uh, to the increasing government demand for innovative evidence-informed solutions. Uh, so everything from these policy dialogues to identify what the problem is, to sharing knowledge from different parts of the country, as well as worldwide, uh, leveraging the administrative data that exists, uh, to, to understand the context and to run low cost, uh, quick interventions, to provide gap assessments, to pilot innovations and test them and then scale them up. So kind of the entire ecosystem, but with a lot more focus on faster responses and much more dedicated resources available in the initial phases. Uh, so something that we're really excited about. But Aspire cannot do it alone, given the ambition of our goals and the vastness of the problem, uh, given that you know, our goal really is to catalyze, number one, improvements in existing programs and policies and introduction of new ones to maximize the impact of government efforts and spending. Number two, to catalyze additional investment by government by expanding the menu of innovative social programs and to catalyze an increased use of data and evidence and policy making. So we would love to partner with governments, with implementing organizations, with donors, and by governments, I mean both state governments as well as central departments, to join this alliance that we are creating to enhance the, our capacity for rapidly co-designing with the government, testing and implementing the solutions with the biggest and fastest impact. Uh, so really, really excited about that. Um, and with that, I will conclude here uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll try and speak from my own experience a little bit, uh, much like how Iqbal landed up much later in Tamil Nadu. Uh, I landed up in Kerala and, um, you know, after my subdivision, one of the first jobs that I got was a job as uh, to transform lives of traditional fishermen in Kerala. And uh, the challenge was that how do you increase, improve their livelihoods and uh, how do you uh, ensure that they get a better return on their daily catch of fish. So we did several things, one of which was to introduce outboard motors so that they could go much further into the sea. They were, they were capable of taking risks, but they could not, with the traditional craft, they could go this far and not further. So outboard motors enabled them to go much further into the sea. We got them new fishing nets. Uh, there were some new innovations which had been done, which were then known as disco nets and then fiberglass crafts uh, so that they could uh, get better crafts. Uh, but one of the key challenges was to introduce uh, beach level auctioning because fish then used to get transferred through 18 different layers of middlemen before it reached the ultimate consumer in Kerala. And uh, uh, so we introduced beach level auctioning and fishermen were prone to drinking and therefore opening their bank account was a challenge. We'd formed their self-help groups, giving, giving them loan and getting these new crafts and nets. So ensuring that they repay back was a challenge. 
the biggest challenge I faced at that point of time was uh, uh, to open their bank accounts. It used to take us eight to nine months of chasing of bank managers. Uh, and uh, know your customer was a nightmare. And uh, it was one of the toughest jobs I've done, but it gave me immense amount of satisfaction uh, to form these self-help groups, introduce new technology, open their bank accounts, do beach level auctioning, and ensure that they get a much higher returns of their catch. And uh, from the beach level auctioning, we could then cut down the number layers of middlemen. Uh, uh, fisher women were finding it very difficult to take their catch and reach the city areas and therefore we introduced fisher women buses where they could keep their baskets of fish catch at the back and sit in front. These were designed only for ca catching, for taking their uh, daily catch of fish to the city colonies. And uh, uh, today there are almost about 30 buses operating. We started with one of them in Trivandrum City. And therefore, uh, what it led to was that uh, fishermen who were just getting about 20% of the market, uh, of the daily price of the market catch, daily catch, it went up to about 85%. And uh, uh, this is all because we were op able to open their bank accounts, they could put money, they could return uh, payments, and uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a job where we had to build a huge amount of state capacity in this new organization. So I, it was an organization with Matsya Fed, which we started almost like a startup. So my life in many ways has been a job of uh, startups and uh, uh, this this really brought to me a couple of lessons. One is that it's very, very important to build capacity in organization, especially if you are doing livelihood programs. Secondly, it's very important to work around data because the daily catch of the fish, how much money is he getting, how much is going into the bank account, how much is he returning, all that data is very critical and if you are able to tell the fisherman that uh, who's very risk oriented that this is the way you will improve your life and it has a very significant bearing on his family then you are able to make a difference to him the third thing which came out very clear that uh, extension and mass communication is very very important which most of us neglect in government uh, how do you how do you nudge behavioral change, and how do you make a very major difference? And therefore, behavioral change has to be a very important and critical part of this. And uh, nudging fishermen's behavior away from drinking into putting money into his bank account and then returning the loan and making a difference in the lives of his family was very critical. So data nudging, capacity building was what I learned in that job and that is what I inculcated. Much later, I became a district collector in uh, Calicut where Vasco de Gama had landed and discovered India. Uh, at that point of time, uh, there was no way you could do many things in districts. You, you can make a difference in learning outcomes, you can make a difference in health outcomes, uh, you can transform lives of people, uh, you have enormous authority and convening power, but there was no way to find out whether your district was going up or down and what is, how is it performing compared to other districts. The data used to be compiled by the district, by the statistics department, and that data used to come out five to six years later. And there was no way that you will find out whether your district was going up or down. And to my mind, uh, that's a, that used to be a huge challenge. Uh, you fast track it to now. I mean, when I was doing fishermen, it used to take me eight to nine months to open a bank account. 
Today in India, you can open a bank account using your biometric in less than a minute. Uh, that time, it was impossible to find out whether your district was going up or down. Uh, as CEO of Niti Aayog, I ran the aspirational district program across 49 indicators. In all these indicators, we could track every single minute on a real-time basis whether the districts were going up or down, coming, whether they were improving on all those outcomes as compared to the other districts or not. Uh, the Dartewada collector came to me, which is one of our uh, tribal districts, aspirational district. He said, when he landed up in my office, he said, sir, I'm coming third overall in the performance in the aspirational district. We had a Champions of Change dashboard. We opened it. I opened it and said that by the time he had left Datewara to the time he reached Delhi, uh, just data and evidence, real-time data, he had slipped from the third to the sixth position because other districts had moved up. And the collector said that he had fallen in this indicator, this indicator, three of the education indicators, two of the health indicators, many of them slow-moving indicators, but the others were working very, very hard, other districts. So he said, Kisa, I'll go back and work hard because 16 days are still left for this month to get completed. He worked very hard. He worked really hard, but he could only come fourth. So you, were, you had real-time data, people were competing, and everybody was trying to go up. So what does 49 indicators, clear outcomes, competition, naming and shaming, putting the data in public domain and putting the ranking of each district in public, uh, in public domain enabled us to do was to really challenge the collectors and the entire team that you have to transform India and this will happen only on the basis of data. This will happen because data is available on the dashboard, you cross-check your performance with reference to others, all real-time data, third-party assessments being made, being put out, and each one of them competing with each other to do better than the other, and that really transformed many of the aspirational districts about which I'll talk a little later. So uh, my experience has been that um, uh, the government ability to transform is very large. It's huge. What you can do in government, you can't do anywhere else. Government is good at certain things. Government is extremely poor in certain things. And my belief always has been that government is able to transform if it is able to work in good partnership with good civil society organizations. And all my career, I worked with good civil society organizations. I worked on the basis of data. And I've always believed that it's competition which spurs change. And it's very important to continuously strive for that. So, you know, then I, I ran uh, foul of the government in Kerala. And actually, I was... Uh, you know, one of the uh, encroachments which I had broken in Kerala, uh, the, uh, the four-star hotel, the person went on to become the deputy chief minister and I was without a post posting for about eight to nine months. And, uh, you know, the, nobody had heard of Kerala at that time as a tourism destination. Uh, everybody used to travel to Rajasthan or they used to go to Kashmir. Nobody knew that there was such a place like Kerala. And nobody wanted to get posted as Secretary of Tourism in Kerala at that point of time. And uh, uh, as a punishment posting after nine months of remaining without posting, I was posted as Secretary of Tourism in Kerala. Uh, I took this as an opportunity uh, to build Kerala as God's own country. I did everything uh, which uh, could differentiate Kerala from the rest of the world. Kerala was then a one-product destination. Kovalam was the only product people had heard of. And it had become a low-value destination. Uh, you used to get charter full of low-value tourists from London and UK, chartered flight. We stopped all that. 
We opened up new products like the backwaters of Kerala, like the houseboats of Kerala. I went back to the roots of Kerala and uh, we uh, brought back the traditional Kerala cuisine, much of which you've, many of you would have heard. We went back to the roots of Kerala through its uh, martial art, culinary pair, through its uh, traditional art forms, uh, Mohini Artam, Kathakali, which are, which are all dying. We brought back the traditional architecture of Kerala. And uh, we did everything which was different from what the Western world was doing to differentiate Kerala. Now, Kerala was already a failed state as far as industries was concerned. Nobody wanted to invest in the industry sector of Kerala. And we built up Kerala as a tourism destination. And uh, we had to prove to the government that this tourism sector is working and is creating jobs. So one of the first things I did was to commission a tourism satellite account because uh, the Tata Consultancy Service, we got to do a tourism satellite account because uh, tourism has huge impact, a multiplier impact on many other areas. It creates jobs in cottage industry, it creates jobs in handicrafts, it creates women's jobs, it creates many things. And that tourism satellite account became the evidence and the data-based document which proved to the communist government of Kerala then that it's creating vast number of jobs. And that led to acceptance of Kerala as a great driver of growth in Kerala and great driver of job creation in Kerala. So I always fell back on evidence. I always fell back on data. I always fell back on the fact that uh, uh, and even in tourism, I truly believe that it has to be community-based. And unlike many other, develop many other states which did tourism, Kerala became a state where community-owned development and community-based development and uh, getting private sector to involve community and differentiate the products from the rest of the world. And Kerala then was selected by National Geographic Traveler as one of the 10 exotic paradises of the world. And they said Kerala is a great exotic paradise, not because of just its natural beauty. It's a great product because of the high rate of literacy, its very high health outcomes, and the fact that this highest level of social indicators when you combine with the methodology of tourism development, that is community-based tourism development, is what has, and this is a very highly responsible tourism development, is what made Kerala a unique tourism product. So, you know, I was sleeping in my house one day and, uh, you know, it was a Sunday and I suddenly get a call that uh, the Prime Minister uh, office, the Principal Secretary, I was a fairly young officer then, the prime, Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister wants to talk to you. So I picked up the phone and there was Mr. Brijesh Mishra on the, uh, came on the line, he was the Principal Secretary and he said, Ms. the Prime Minister, Mr. Vajpayee wants to come and ho have a holiday in Kerala. And he said, he will not meet any politician, he will not meet the chief minister, you will be his host, you do the entire packaging of this thing. You dev So I arranged a seven days holiday in Kumaragam in the backwaters of Kerala. And morning, evening, I used to take him out to, into the backwaters and demonstrated Ayurveda and many other things to him. So one fine day, uh, you know, Mr. Bajesh Mishra said, Ki, sahab, is ladke ne bahut kaam kiya hai. Tourism is ko Delhi lana hai. So Mr. Vajpayee looked at me and he said, Ki, Amitabh ji, aapne Delhi ke liye, Bharat Sarkar ke liye apply kiya hai? So I said, nahi sir, maine to nahi kiya. So Mr. Vajpayee said, nahi, bahut achcha ki aapne nahi apply kiya. Agar aap apply karenge, to Brajesh Mishra ji aapko tourism ke badle women and child welfare mein bhez denge. So we laughed and forgot about it. I applied one year, three months later. And I was selected to go to Ministry of Finance and then again I get a call from Mr. Brijesh Mishra and he said, Ki, Do you, uh, have you applied for Delhi? So I said, yes. So he said, Ki, uh, 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 you, do you know where you're going? So I said, sir, I'm told that the Civil Services Board has selected me to go to the Finance Ministry. So he said, no, you are not going. You remember the conversation that day? We are posting you to Tourism Ministry. So I said, sir, but... Uh, I have, uh, there's no vacancy there. So they said, this is none of your concern. They created a post and posted me as Joint Secretary Tourism as soon as I landed. 
the twin tower blast in new york happened the war in afghanistan happened uh, attack on our parliament happened tourism advisories were issued against india and our uh, occupancy in our existing hotels and we had very few hotels at that point of time came down to 10% so the challenge was how do you raise to bring in more tourists that was the challenge so i went to tour operators and said that i have to do this uh, so that time tourism used to be sold by selling packages so i went to them and said that we'll uh, we'll give you advertisement support this they said there's no consumer demand and at the peak of that crisis we launched the incredible india campaign at a point when thailand malaysia singapore had all stopped and we drove this 360 degree campaign across uh, across digital across uh, television across everything we drove and made it a very very uh, strong powerful incredible india campaign to revive consumer demand that brought back consumer demand and that consumer demand led to the creation of new airlines it led to the creation of new airports in delhi mumbai bangalore hyderabad but it was all data it was all evidence based because we were tracking every single digital ad every single commercial ad and what kind of impact it was having on consumer mind we constantly changed based on feedback different markets we used different campaigns some on children some on women japan we went with a all women campaign some on thing because the data was it was constant feedback from the campaign which enabled us to penetrate global markets so my belief always has been that feedback is critical constant monitoring is important constant evaluation is important nothing in government should be sacrosanct forever that you have prepared a project or a scheme which will remain sacrosanct it should be the monitoring it should be the evaluation it should be the data it should be the evidence which should make you transform things that is what i have constantly believed in in every single program uh, when i became secretary dpiit whether it was startup india we started with just what 150 startups in india today there are 78000 startups in india there are 105 106 unicorns in india and all this is a consequence of uh, the huge amount of digitization the huge amount of innovation is the huge amount of uh, the the work which the jam trinity in india has done the huge amount of wealth of data that india has created it's all a consequence of that so one of the key things one of the key challenges in uh, uh, niti aayog as ceo was that uh, how do you make how do you ensure that uh, there are no two indias and we are able to make uh, people living in backward areas grow and advance and uh, in you know in one of the program in one of the chief ministers conference of niti aayog i made a presentation and i showed to the chief minister that these are red 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 districts which are remaining backwards in india so after that meeting the prime minister called me and he said that uh, let's focus on these districts uh, so we selected these districts through a very transparent process we selected 115 districts of india and he said we are going to make a difference to these 115 districts of india uh, this program covered the most backward districts of india really and backward districts are some of the most far flung really far flung districts of india and it's not easy you know i mean look at a look at a district like baksa in assam which is on the indo bhutan border or look at a district like kifre uh, in uh, nagaland or look at a district like namsai in arunachal pradesh many of these districts name you may not have even heard of they are really far flung districts and where the there's a huge amount of backwardness we didn't call this the prime minister said don't call it backward called it called we called it the aspirational district program and in the aspirational districts if you look at it 115 districts bengal west bengal did not participate the 112 districts we took up for uh, transformation and that covered about 20% of india's population it covered almost about 8660 gram panchayats of india and we created a base level of on all these 49 indicators where these districts are when we started this program in january 28 
that in these districts, this is the baseline which we need to transform. We also looked at the state average, where the state average is in these districts, and our challenge was that in three years' time, we'll make these districts overtake the state average, and in five years' time, we'll make them the best performing districts of their states. That was, and these were really backward districts, not because there was lack of fund. All these districts were getting the same fund. But the challenge was that these districts, there was low morale, there was no evidence, there was no data, there was uh, officers would come for five, six months, there was no teamwork, uh, very poor governance in these districts. So how do you improve governance? was the challenge. It's not about money. You can give money to anybody. You keep giving, pouring money, uh, these districts will not change, but these districts can change if you can improve governance. And the governance functioning is because of evidence. And therefore, what we did was that we identified 49 indicators across five different areas, education, health, skill, financial inclusion, agriculture. Said we are going to transform these 49 indicators, we'll transform these districts. And what we started doing then was that we said we will make these districts, uh, all the departments in these districts converge. We will collaborate with civil society organizations. We will put data at the heart of this. We will get this data on a real time basis and we'll make these districts compete. And we'll pick out best practices from these districts and then post, ask other districts to replicate it. So, what happened as a consequence of this is really path-breaking in many ways because many of these districts have done really because of the competition, because of the collaboration, because of the convergence. Uh, this has led to a huge, in very short time, there's been a very rapid improvement in many of the key performance indicators. In many key performance indicators, majority of the districts have crossed the state average. And, you know, in several of them, these aspirational districts have emerged as the best performing districts. And this has actually led to a huge improvement in the state performance and in India's performance. You know, I just wanted to give you some example of the kind of transformation which data, which evidence-based and with capacity building at the district level can do. And capacity building need not be of the, uh, through government officials. I'm a great believer that if you work in partnership with civil society organizations, it makes a huge transformation. So if you look at percentage of antenatal care registered within the first trimester, uh, Chitrakoot, a district like Chitrakoot, it was at 40, its base level was 40%. Today is it at 97%. 97%. If you look at percentage of institutional deliveries in the total estimated deliveries in the district, a place like Baksa in Assam was 43% only. Today is it clocking 98% institutional delivery. That's the kind of jump it has taken. Look at the percentage of pregnant women taking supplementary nutrition under ICDS program. Firozpur was at 33%. It's today 99%. 99%. That's the kind of jump which these districts have taken. If you look at percentage of children fully immunized in the 9 to 11 months with BCG, DPT, measles, etc., a place like Saib Ganj was just 28%. Today it is at, it, today it is at 84%. Uh, similarly, percentage of very severe acute mal malnourishment, uh, you know, Darang in Assam, 16.9, uh, and here it's lower the better, it's come down radically. And many of these districts, like Darang in Assam, is the best performing district in the state. Uh, Bihar, Nevada and Bihar is the best performing state the district. Serohi in Rajasthan is the best performing district, and so on. So I'm a great believer that it's constant feedback, constant monitoring and evaluation, which is what the DMU and Niti Aayog used to do. It's dispersal of funds must be based on performance. I believe that this will be a in huge incentive for institutional transformation. And if, there, if you do not have evidence-based, if you, there is a, Huge focus has to be on evidence-based policies framework. 
uh, and policies have to be grounded in data. Without that, you can't make transformation. And we need to significantly improve our ability to get data gathering and data analysis capabilities. And that's why Nitya and government is full of data. Government is just full of data. We never collate. We never do it scientifically. We never put it out in an attractive manner. And therefore, in Niti Aayog, we created the National Data Analytics Portal so that data must reach out to researchers. Data must reach out to civil society organizations. Then only transformation will take place. And therefore, it requires our ability to improve data processing uh, through a lot of use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. It requires ability to collect, store, and process a data on a continuous basis, on a really continuous basis. And it requires a huge ability to uh, constantly conduct experiments at the grassroots level. And these experiments could be uh, randomized control trials to pilot the study. And without these experiments, we'd never be able to formulate the right policies. And therefore, my belief is uh, that convergence, cooperation, I've also worked with a lot of lateral entrants in government. We created a big cohort of about 350 young lateral entrants in government, the biggest the government has ever seen. Uh, in Niti Aayog, and they brought a tremendous amount of energy, and I've always believed in working with civil society organizations. So that has been my experience. I just thought I'd share my own experience. Uh, I don't want to talk about theory. I have um, have very little knowledge of theory. I just believe in uh, delivery on ground and transformation on ground. And what has led to transformation in ground is what I spoke about. And what comes out clearly from that is that data, evidence, civil society organizations, and constant competition and convergence really hold the key to success. Uh, without this, uh, the scale and size of government uh, has to match with good work by civil society organizations. Without that, transformation will not happen. Vikrant, you spoke earlier this morning about uh, you know, what Vedis does. As a philanthropist, what is your motivation behind putting money behind policy? You've invested heavily into policy and effective governance. What are your thoughts behind that? I'm not an expert at anything. And it was very refreshing to hear data being mentioned. Uh, I'm not a creator. I was pathetic at write creative writing. I used to be good at math. So for me, I like to understand things using numbers. Uh, if I send an email, there'll be a lots of bullet points and idly more numbers than, than, than words. Uh, so when I started looking at sectors to focus on, I'd speak to people in the developmental sector and ask them if I was totally agnostic to where my money should go, uh, what should I focus on? And typically, I'd get a long story based on people's vested interests, so whatever sector they were involved in, that's the most impactful. Said, okay, so we made a number of donations to a number of organizations over the years, and then I realized uh, we, we, there's one particular thing where we did something, ended up working with the government, and it, th there was an aha moment. So the entire not-for-profit sector, uh, the spend is less than 1% of the government's annual developmental spend. So all of us, and I say all of us, as in the not-for-profit sector running various organizations, we can all think, hey, we're doing an amazing job trying to do stuff directly. I mean, that'll pale in comparison to what the government does. So if you could, if we could, have a marginal improvement in, and I say marginal, I and mean, hopefully you can have a significant improvement, if you could only marginally improve the quality of policy implementation, that's a huge win. Uh, if you can slightly help policy makers, policy formulators, improve their decision making because they've got a lot of power and massive budgets, uh, that would be amazing. And therefore, over a period of 10 years, I've gone completely from, if 10 years ago somebody had asked me, uh, there is not a chance I would have said we'd be working with the government. Today, when people ask me, our focus is entirely working with uh, organizations, 
that work with the government, either helping policy formulators and or policy implementation, or directly working with the government. So hence the focus. It's only numbers, it's evidence-based, it's data, data-based, and why we focus on working with improving governance. Okay, great. Uh, so you, in all the examples that you gave us, whether it is a fisherman example or uh, the tourism example, both at the state and the center, uh, or the aspirational districts, you, you know, I saw a lot of s parallels in terms of you had evidence-based product, and then you built the marketing engine behind this, and, and then you put the monitoring and evaluation layer, and then you really went to town with it, building capacity. In all your writings, you talk a lot about capacity building um, at the state level. How do, you know, how, what do you see a state's need to do in order to build capacity in their kind of human resources and staffing? And do you see a role for collaboratives such as Aspire to play a part there? So my belief is that if India is to transform uh, in a very big way and rapidly grow, you know, if India is to grow at high rates, uh, 9 to 10 percent for three decades or more, uh, year after year, year after year, and use the compounding power of his growth, then literacy, education, uh, health outcomes, and nutrition. Nutrition, uh, all this is very critical. You can't grow. India can grow for a short period, five to six years. But beyond that, if you want to sustain this growth for a three-decade period, then education, health, nutrition really holds the key. Now, my belief is that the capacity at the state level is very, very poor because uh, states are used to physical and financial achievement. You know, they provide allocation. They said, have you used this one third? Okay, now you get the next one third. N then you finish that, you get the next one third. What is the output and what is the outcome? Nobody focuses on the outcome aspect of it. Has it really transformed learning outcomes? Has it improved health outcomes? Has it led to better? Why should, why should in India, one in two women after 75 years of independence, one in two women be anemic? Why should one in three children be stunted? So the outcomes are very critical to my mind and that's a function of health capacity. That's a function of your ability to converge women ch and child welfare. The ASHA worker, the Anganwadi worker, the school teacher, uh, the health worker, all of them must converge at the grassroots to transform themselves. And therefore, data convergence, and then start comp making them compete and say that I'm putting out this data in public domain. Why will India not transform? Why will India not change with this? Bound to change. And that, to my mind, is really the key. But the key to all this is that the government is one must get a lot of, there are a lot of young Indians who want to transform India. That's my experience of Niti Ayo. Very talented young Indians from across the world who want to, very qualified, uh, they want to come and transform India. And get, build in a set of young, energetic, vibrant, dynamic, young Indians who are full of passion and energy to transform India at the grassroots level. They will do the work for you. They will be fully committed, and that's too important. And thirdly, all of us must learn the art of working with good civil society organizations and a vast number of... In Niti Aayog, we work with Tata Trust, we work with Piramal Trust, we work with Lupin Trust, we work with so many of them. All of them did remarkable work. So all the success that we've achieved is because of all that. The work on ground was being done by them in partnership with the district collectors and the young officers. So that is critical to my mind. We, we actually had uh, a young officer from Tamil Nadu earlier today uh, who was just, you know, uh, talking about his experiences in, you know, in a very unique way that kind of uh, got a lot of people at, uh, people's attention. I don't know if Vishnu is still here. Uh, but uh, Shobini, you work with states. Uh, you go through this in your day-to-day. -day. I mean, this is your life uh, for JPAL and Aspire now. Um, how much do you see the level of strategic thinking that a Niti Aayog does at the center? How much does that happen at the grassroots level? How, how, you know, what are some of the challenges that you see? And, you know, how do you see the next 75 years, if I can stretch that a bit? Yeah. <laughs> So I think uh, uh, Murugan, I'm very much a person of 
the now. The I, I, I'm right now in working across many, many, many state governments, many different departments. So I will talk about the now, and then we can, you know, I, I would, you know, have Mr. Uh, Mr. Khan talk about the future from his perspective. But I think, you know, right now we are partnering with over, like I had mentioned, over 20 states and certainly government agencies, uh, and we, and I think we have been working in this now for the last 15 years in India. Uh, there are a few key lessons, I think, in terms of how we, you know, what we've learned. And the first is it's working at the grassroots level, working with civil society organizations in partnership with governments. Uh, that's the collaboration that you need to bring together to transform uh, change and impact at scale. It's a constant work in progress. Uh, it's, and I say this because we, you know, we have to have the system set up with governments to be able to, uh, you know, sort of weather political and bureaucratic changes. Uh, we, you know, there are transfers. A good idea sometimes gets shelved because the bureaucrat has changed. The champions uh, have moved elsewhere. So, you know, setting up those institutional partnerships, setting up long-run partnerships with departments, with uh, central nodal agencies, that's really key to being able to sustain uh, and, and create that impact or be there for the long uh, haul and be there to build these partnerships. So it's all about, so that's one piece I think that we've learned is actually, you know, and the underlying objective for us has been to use data and evidence to create champions. And we always look for people who are uh, evidence, you know, in, when we're working with Mr. Kant or we're working across many states, I think for us it's really understanding, you know, who are the policy makers who would respond to evidence. We need, you know, it, uh, it's, it's a little bit about having the right champions, but also set helping, you know, getting that, uh, that partnership going to be able to set up the necessary mechanisms for long-run partnerships so that we are able to be there. Uh, and constant work in progress from another perspective uh, is, is testing. So I, it's, it's, it's a process of iteration. So you don't have all the solutions. Uh, we'll never have all the solutions. So it's really co-creating and designing these solutions together with our partners on the ground. Uh, a lot of it is looking at sort of, you know, policy dialogues, uh, understanding what's important, doing a deeper diagnostics, field level insights, you know, working with policymakers to understand what it is that they're prioritizing, and then being able to take that to the next step of really co-creating the solution, testing it rigorously, looking at, you know, what are the levers of change, how can we take that to scale? will come from working with uh, with governments. I think in terms of challenges, there's one big challenge that we face, and you know, Mr. Kant has talked about it himself, is, is how do we bring all of these brilliant young Indians uh, to work with us, and how do we get the funding for them to be able to work a, at large scale uh, to build state capacity? I think that is a challenge for civil study organizations, for organizations like ours, evidence to uh, policy organizations. Uh, we, you know, we, need, we, need, we need not only champions, but we need uh, sort of donors uh, like yourselves, to be able to create that uh, space for us to test it. Nobody is going to, it's a high risk capital. Nobody is going to innovate, uh, nobody is going to put money in a proof of concept that you don't know whether it works or not, it doesn't work. So having that mindset is very important to say, I'm ready to test, I'll fail, I'll learn from that, let me test. Um, that's, that's risk capital. Who is going to put that money in so that we can put our people in, you know, uh, to collaborate with governments to build that sort of, uh, to build these collaborations. It's a call to action for some donors and, and I see some here. <laughs> that you know, Aspire is looking for anchor partners and anchor funders as well, so uh, we're happy to talk to you. So I, I will make a plug here. So we actually have a few, so I'm talking about challenges, but we have a few successful partnership models, and I think Iqbal had talked about it as well a little bit in terms of the institutional partnerships that we built in Tamil Nadu, which we're taking to states like Odisha and Punjab. Uh, we're, we're expanding that model as well, and there I think we have all the necessary uh, sort of steps in place. So we've got a partnership, we've got champions, we've got uh, sort of, you know, the government themselves is putting in money and into innovations and testing these solutions. So it's, it's really an ecosystem that's coming together. So that's, that's really, I feel, one of the ways to sort of build that, uh, build that ecosystem too. So a lot of innovation today is starting to mean tech, right? Um, and sir, you, you know, in your, uh, Tenure, you've seen technology go from, you know, the examples that you gave where it took eight, nine months to today where it takes a minute. If you talk to the tech companies where I was part of and we met earlier at Cisco, they will say that this is just 1.0, right? The, the best or, you know, is ahead in terms of what technology can do to improve lives and livelihoods. How do you think and how, do, how did you see this at Niti Aayog? in terms of planning for tech disruptions because they were really fast and come wave after wave every quarter almost. And you know, what, how do you see GovTech kind of changing over the next couple of decades? 
you know i've always been a believer that uh, technology will uh, can be really transformational in many of these areas and uh, uh, no country in the world has been able to create the kind of public platforms that we've been able to create uh, both in terms of uh, what we've done with biometric what we've been able to do with bank accounts what we've been able to do with mobile and much later what we've been able to do with uh, uh, you know the unified payment interface uh, i have not used my debit or credit card for about 3 years now uh, i've uh, done all i do all my digital transactions using my mobile my mobile is my bank so uh, no country has been able to use individual identity and public platforms to drive change the way india has done and that's very different from the kind of model which the west has run where data is all owned by big tech whereas here we have allowed uh, pri private enterprise to compete on pub on top of the public platform so uh, google pay whatsapp pay they are all competing with phone pay and paytm and uh, uh, quite often indian companies are beating them or ola is competing with uber in the indian market so india has created a vast amount of data uh, because the data costs have been very low it's 120 th the cost of data in united states 110 th the cost of data in uk so we've created a huge amount of data and uh, my belief always has been that uh, india's becoming a data intelligent country is very critical to be able to use ai ml to transform the social sectors of india health and there are many startups which are doing this you know now uh, transforming learning outcomes there are many who are doing it in health i mean what we've done with the covin platform is path breaking uh, i mean everything was digital our whole vaccination drive 200 crore vaccination shots all digital uh, i don't think it's happened in anywhere in the west it's not happened in uk it's not happened in usa it's all digital process so you've been you india has been able to create a vast amount of data to transform education health agriculture and that would be the next big surge of change in these social sectors and when you're making impact in these sectors you're not transforming the lives of 1.4 billion people of india but you will actually be transforming the your market will be the next 4 to 5 billion people of the world will be moving from poverty to middle class and that is a huge huge market for indian tech companies young startups who will make a difference in social sectors you don't need driverless cars in india i mean the silicon valley may need it india doesn't need it india needs transformation in health outcomes in learning outcomes in agriculture production and productivity that's what these startups are doing now uh, yeah fantastic i i your example reminded me of the funny situation with krant when uk said uh, no to indian tourists because they couldn't validate the uh, validate the vaccinations when the uk vaccinations you were you were saying were handwritten or you know card written or something or you know i don't know that conversation or the us vaccinations were handwritten all right the and us was, was digital, digital. Yeah. so keeping on the digital theme then vikrant um if you know what mr khan said needs to happen which is tech based digital disruptions in social sectors that puts the onus on civil society organizations also to adopt technology and kind of sometimes be leading adopters so far you know historically they've been kind of you know lagging adopters of technology how do you see that happening in terms of or what do you think that needs to happen in the, in civil society for organizations to kind of look ahead in terms of technology use so i think we use tech in a very broad sense right tech is everywhere i electricity was tech when electricity was originally invented so today the, what we call tech is everywhere uh everything we do we use tech I think from a civil society point of view, I'd say more the use of data as opposed to use of tech. Uh, and it's not just an India problem. Uh, people in the not-for-profit world tend to not use data. I think it's convenient to be storytellers as opposed to uh, selling stories with data because with data comes accountability. With accountability, you run the risk of losing funding. so i think and so that's on the on the not for profit side and i would say even on the on the donor side uh people who build businesses fully backed you know, on the basis of numbers uh, very analytical people so people from uh, financial services people from regular sort of 
any other sort of business sectors. In a boardroom, it's all data, but when it comes to an NGO boardroom, somehow people leave their sort of their thinking caps out and they only think with their hearts. So I think to, to respond to your question, I, I wouldn't say uh, civil society to start adopting tech, but start using your heads, which everybody does have, but use the thinking cap on more, use data more to actually be accountable to yourself, demand accountability from the organizations we're working with. Uh, you know, it was absolutely refreshing to hear Mr. Uh, Mr. Kant use data and how his journey through sort of various initiatives. That's what any successful, call it a tech startup, or any successful company would use all of those. So you test, you look for feedback, and then you scale up whatever works. So, and I'm a huge believer in feedback. So where even what I eat and how much I sleep would be a ring, watch, uh, continuous glucose monitor, et cetera. So it's all about feedback, but that's, why does it get, why does it help? If you're one who is able to change behavior based on feedback that you get, that'll only help you improve. So people are not willing to listen to feedback. There's nothing one can do, so there, nothing can be done but use data as opposed to just tech, and data is aided by tech. Thank you very much, sir, for your time, uh, spending with us and sharing your examples, very powerful examples which would actually give a path for the next few decades for, for India, for policymakers, for civil society organizations, for all of us to use data. Like you said, you know, data is everywhere. We all need to use it. Thank you all of you for uh, being here uh, for this session uh, and you know, being part of the governance and state capacity track.